command of the 2nd Marine Division. We're now embarking on a full-scale amphibious operation after many months of intensive training. The transports are combat loaded. The ships of the Navy and Coast Guard form our convoy. Squadrons of carrier planes cover us in the sky. Several days from our destination, the destroyer brings us sealed orders. It won't be long now before we know where we're bound. The relief map of our objective is broken out. Fortified island of Betio and the Tarawa Atoll, a very important Jap air base on the outer fringe of their Pacific defenses. Our platoon leaders started explaining the terrain to us. By the time they were finished, we knew that island and its reefs as well as we knew our own backyards. We built more machine gun ammunition. Check and test fire all weapons. Exercise helped to relieve the tension. Navy and Coast Guard coxswains received last minute instructions on formations, rendezvous areas, and departure times. Services are held on the last evening before D Day. We liked listening to Father Kelly. He'd been with us at Guadalcanal. He had a way of saying what we wanted to hear. Many of these men were killed the following morning. We are ready. the day we attack. Long before daylight, we're over the side into amphibian tractors and landing boats. At daylight, our naval vessels open fire, and for four solid hours, they pound Tarawa with high explosives. the Navy planes would take over, bombing, strafing. We were a team working together. Then, again according to plan, the planes withdraw and the ship's batteries open up again. Each hour, the hour we attack is getting close. For three days before we moved in, over four million pounds of explosives have been dropped on the island. It didn't seem possible that anyone could live through that bombardment. guns constantly strafed our assault waves. We bombed them out twice, but each time a new crew took over. One of our planes scores a direct hit. As we approach the island, we have the feeling that the show is just about over. There doesn't seem to be any organized resistance. However, we're taking no chances. Suddenly, we're met by heavy machine gun and mortar fire. It takes a heavy toll of our boats and men. It doesn't stop us. We fight our way onto the 
beach. A long pier extending across the fringing reef gives protection to a lot of our boys on the way in. We have a pretty good toehold on the beach, but Jap fire pins us down for hours. are pretty high, but as we found out later, blood plasma saves a lot of lives. When reinforcements arrive, we start moving up. out of their positions. They're hidden in trees behind revetments, buried pillboxes, bomb proofs, bunkers. is giving us plenty of trouble. We have orders to clean it up.
such fighters. Their lives mean nothing to them. One of our boys is hit. At night, the Japs would swim out to our wrecked amphibians and set up machine guns. They got a few of us before we got them. The commanding officer of the assault troops confers with his staff. One of our medium tanks remains in operation. Although at the end of the second day, D plus one, we breathe a little easier, mortar squads continue to hammer enemy points of resistance. By this time, we know the Japs are licked. They must know it, too. There's still strong resistance. Nip suicide snipers tie themselves up in the trees and take pot shots at us. We hit them, but they don't fall. Just die and hang there. constant activity. Amphibians tow in fresh supplies, food, ammunition, guns. As the battle moves across the island, the chaplain's assistants tend the dead, removing the lower identification tick and leaving the duplicate on each marine so there'll be no mistake later on. Generals Holland Smith and Julian Smith commanding the force and division. Admiral Harry Hill, commanding the task force. Sometimes we actually have to dig the Japs out of their holes. The island is infested with buried pillboxes, many of them still crawling with Japs. These bunkers were so constructed that heavy shelling and demolition charges failed to crumble them. Many of them were over 20 feet deep. First prisoners. The wounded are given first aid in the field and then carried by stretcher to the boats. With them always are the Navy hospital corpsmen and Navy doctors and surgeons. At the transport, the steel litters are lifted from the barges and lowered into the hold. They're taken to the ship's hospital. Not a second is lost. These are marine dead. This is the price we have to pay for a war we didn't want. And before it's over, there'll be more dead on other battlefields.
burial aboard ship for Marines killed in action. Just to make sure they're not concealing weapons, the prisoners are lined up and their clothes cut away. We gave them new ones later from their own dumps. The rest of the island's defending force is dead. None escaped. Tokyo once boasted that it would cost 100,000 of our men to take Taro. We lost less than a thousand. The Japs over four thousand. A wounded Jap soldier. We took very few of these. Most of our prisoners were Korean laborers. One of our officers captured these Japs from a disabled landing boat. Prisoners carry their own wounded to the pier for evacuation. Captured Jap water. This is the first chance the boys have had to wash since they got on the island. Gunfire from our warships knocked these big guns out early in the bombardment. These were English Vickers guns captured by the Japs in Singapore. One of their many light tanks. This was the Jap command post, built of reinforced concrete several feet thick. That building was built to withstand plenty, and did. We finally took it with TNT and flamethrowers. The fighting was still going on at one end of the island when the sea bees landed with their heavy equipment. They set to work clearing the airstrip even while we were fighting for it. just 24 hours after the CBs had started to work. The second one lands one minute later. We welcome the pilot to our new home. It was our first chance to thank those guys for the swell job they did for us before and during the attack. On D plus four, our relief came in. Maybe you think we weren't glad to see them. I guess all of us knew from the first, no matter how tough the going was, that we'd take the island. Just the same the day the colors were run up on this palm tree and flew for the first time over Tarawa, we got a lump in our throats. We were mighty proud.
island of Guam shelling Jap installations late one afternoon, about two weeks before the landing. Suddenly, we notice strange light flashes from the peak of a nearby hill. The message in Navy code was baffling. I have information. What could this mean? We signaled the unknown party to advance to the beach. We suspected Jap trickery. Keeping our guns trained point blank on that strip of beach, the captain dispatched a boat which proceeded slowly to meet the person who had sent the signal. unkempt figure, crying and laughing in his joy and excitement. When he was able to talk, he identified himself as radio man George Tweed, United States Navy, the only survivor of the original garrison of Guam. Slowly, a strange story came out. How we took to the hills during the original Jap attack. How we lived alone in the jungle, changing his hiding place daily, sometimes hourly, for 31 months, while endless Jap patrols hunted him like an animal. How courageous natives smuggled him food and news and warnings of danger. Here was a Robinson Crusoe who had stood up alone against the whole Japanese empire. When the destroyer with Tweed aboard rejoined the main task force, he was amazed by the size of the fleet, larger even than he'd hoped for during his 31 months of hiding. Battleships, cruisers, destroyers, carriers, so many of them, and assault troop ships and assault cargo ships of a kind that didn't even exist when Tweed became a fugitive. The fleet has come to this staging base, itself so recently in Japan, loaded and powered for the attack on Guam. Now, while a band swings out, heavy shells are taken aboard. The finishing touch, the seal that will sting. The big claws, these 14-inch shells, will rip out shore installations, make the landing less costly in American lives. Cans of 40-millimeter ammunition pile up in great mounds on deck. A curtain of fire waiting to be raised if needed. There, across the water, lies Guam means much to all Americans, but most of these sailors, they're Guamanians, Americans too, Americans known as Chamorros, whose families have been captives of the Japs for 31 bitter months. Soon we will find out what those Japs have done to our island. Beautiful it was then, and living there made us happy. There were 21,000 of us, and we knew each other as friends. Although we were far out in the Pacific, we were proud to be under the American flag. We were content. It was a good life. The Navy ran the island like a great ship. It gave us doctors and hospitals, and there was care for everyone and free schooling. With many of us younger boys, our big ambition was to go up and join the Navy. Our older men learned about self-government from the captain who was in charge of the island. We organized our own militia. Our heroes were the Marines, but there were not many of them, the Marines of Guam. Few they were indeed, the Marines of 
Guam. Japan would consider any move to strengthen Guam an unfriendly act. It would be like pointing a gun at a neighbor's door. But behind this neighbor's door, the masters of Japan were pointing guns of their own. And they saw in Guam a key to their dream of empire. Their agents among us were busy. Guam was not to be an obstacle to the plans of Tokyo. Then on a certain day in December 1941, the masters of Japan were ready. The war was on. Garrison on Guam, it was over almost before it began. The Navy Department announces that it is unable to communicate with Guam, either by radio or cable. The island has been bombed repeatedly and Japanese troops have landed at several points. A small force of less than 400 naval personnel and 155 Marines were stationed in Guam. The capture of the island is probable. Guam now belongs to Japan forever. Never again will Americans touch its soil. The return to Guam, we knew, would take many ships. In the months that followed, we built such fleets that we were able to start the march back at Guadalcanal. At this ridiculous rate of advance, America might recover its lost territory in perhaps 200 years. Then we made enough planes to begin whittling down the Jap fleet. It grew strong enough to attack New Guinea. Our axes arise are pinning America down in Europe. We shall be very much stronger before America is free to move in the Pacific. We built our way out of the sea. With amphibious operations, we blasted Tarawa and the Marshals. We are willing to sell you land at a thousand lives per acre. At such a price, we will sell you a million square miles if you win. Then we were ready for the great adventure, an attack on Japanese territory. We conquered Saipan. But not Guam. Guam is secure. Guam is Japan. Guam is Japanese forever. Today, our guns thunder their answer. Our guns are on target. The target is Guam. New planes come up to meet ours. The island has been plastered for weeks in the air. FD 
ABC, urgent. Mopping up. The phrase sounds tame and unexciting. Actually, mopping up is one of the most gruesome and dangerous jobs of the war. The last hysterical fanatics must be captured or destroyed before victory is complete. We've returned to Guam. It's ours again. But the cost has been high. Twenty-six Americans have died. In dying, each man disposed of ten Japs. But one thousand two hundred and twenty-six fellow Americans have died. Here are the sons of heaven. These are the members of the divine race. These are the men who set out to conquer the earth. Where now is the imperial arrogance which went forth to bestride the world? The loudspeaker calls, Geneva Convention, we will not hurt you. Out of the hills where they'd hidden come a throng of Japanese civilians. They're bewildered. Not so much by the bombardment, though that was severe enough. Their emperor has failed them. Not so long ago, they turned their backs on their sacred mountain and sailed to Guam. This was to be their colony, their promised land, and the Chamorros would be their slaves. They came to stay forever. Now the plans of empire lie in ruins. Guam's destiny as a fortress of Japan has been smashed. Now a new Marine garrison takes up the watch on Guam. Today, an American task force controls the waters off Guam. Two months after his rescue, George Tweed, now warrant officer and holder of the Legion of Merit for his aid in the recovery of Guam, returned to the island to prepare a final report on his strange adventure. I came close to dying a hundred times during the last two and a half years, but when those American planes and ships came over, I almost died of joy. All that power, that was a sight for sore eyes. The Navy sure had the stuff. I didn't have to wonder anymore what the folks back home had been doing while I was playing hide and seek with the Japs. But the Japs did a few other things besides chase me around. When they started fortifying, they built up their defenses like mad. They were racing against time. A lot of Chamorro blood was mixed up in that concrete. The Japs forced them to work for practically nothing. And the ones who couldn't stand the gaff were beaten and tortured. I'll bet they were a little too busy to mistreat the natives when we started coming over. Not the Japs, sir. They always find time for that. When they got worried about the Americans coming back, they treated the Chamorros even worse. 
When the natives could get together in groups, it wasn't for celebration, not at first. They prayed for their dead. Some of these were victims of terrible butchery. This one had his head cut off for turning it up to a sky filled with American bombers. This one couldn't hide his joy when a zero crashed into the sea. This one tried to help one of our pilots. This is Jap justice as I saw it. The Japs brought slavery and misery and death to the natives of Guam. These people are my friends. They saved my life. When I returned, the Chamorros were getting their first good meals in a long time and their first decent medical care, some of it for babies born during the occupation. I would like to visit them again when the war is over. Until then, I want to do everything I can to knock the hell out of those Japs. I was there in the beginning, and I want to be there at the finish. People of Guam, the government of the United States, your government promises your homes will rise again. Your losses will be restored. But what is done for Guam is only part of what Guam will do for the people of America and the peace of the world. Guam will now become everything that a powerful American base should be. Great installations will rise as sentinels of our security and the peace of the world. From Guam, the attack goes forward. From here, the winning blow may be struck against Japan. On to Guam, on to every other place we win, we must pour the power that will clear the path to Tokyo. This base, which was lost and is now redeemed, may now fulfill its destiny and launch the action that will help win the war. Thank you.